Hello guys, I would like to welcome you to this week's Sunday School lesson. In this week's lesson, the pastor will share with you this week's powerful Sunday School lesson review. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also, if you would like to donate to our new Bethel Baptist Church Ministries, you can donate any amount to P.O. Box 18661, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and zip code 39404. Also, cash app capabilities in the descriptions, and don't forget the pastor's Sunday school lesson notes are below as well. God bless you guys and enjoy the lesson. Hi. I'm Brother Lars Jordan, pastor of the New Bethel Baptist Church located at 2729 Oak Grove Road in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And today our Sunday School lesson for August the 13th, 2023 is the nature of the kingdom. And our Bible scriptures today are taken from Romans, the 14th chapter. Our printed text is verses 10 through 23. And we're still in this quarterly theme of the righteous reign of God. And our unit of study right now is God's eternal reign. And we go into this to, to move into this 14th chapter, still talking about the kingdom and God's eternal reign, the righteous reign of God. We've been dealing with the kingdom issues for, for a while now. And now we go into this 14th chapter where the Apostle Paul has some very pointed statements that he would make. And as I study, because I've, I've, I've taught through the, the, the book of Romans, but going through it again, thinking of it on this particular mindset caused me some challenges as I began to go through this. It, it, it put some, some breaks up in front of me and say, you, you need to work on this particular area or that particular area and 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 then we we read into it in our lesson today and they skip the first nine verses we'll deal with them we'll 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 go through them quickly to read them to help us understand where we are the reason that we got to verse 10 because verse 10 starts with but which means it's a conjunction to the things that was mentioned before it the first verse starts out, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Don't dispute with that person. Don't get into disputes with them. Don't get into arguments with them, the people that are weak in the faith. Well, the first thing that a person would ask is, who is the person that is weak in the faith? A person that is weak in the faith, it, faith isn't necessarily a person that is a, a new convert. What he is getting into here is a person that is weak in the faith, maybe a person that has gotten into traditionalism and don't realize that they have liberty in Jesus Christ, that they have liberty because of the grace of God, because uh, uh, of how the, the Christian faith is set up. They have liberty. Don't be entangled. We found out in our last week's lesson in the bondage again, because you can be bound by rules, regulations, and restrictions, and, and even go to putting those things on top of other people, and people will find that, that, that Christianity looks sour and dour to them. Why would I want to be saved? And those people never seem to even have a good time. They can't smile. They can't enjoy this or enjoy that. He said those that are weak in the faith, some are weak in the faith. And he'll go on to kind of explain that. He said, for one believeth that he may eat all things, colon, another who is weak. He said the person that is weak is the person that don't have, that, that can't seem to live in the liberty that he's been given through the person of Jesus Christ. Another who is weak, either herbs. Uh, he's eating just vegetables. He, he's a vegetarian. He's, he feels like he can only eat kosher food. And so, but, but that one, that is a, a the, but they're both believers. They're both Christians. They're both a part of the kingdom of God. They're both in the church. They're, they're part of the body of Christ. One believes that he can eat whatever he wants to eat. He can sit down with a 16 ounce prime rib it cooked medium well, and, and uh, I might be telling on myself, but cooked just right, and he can eat it and 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 be satisfied with it. But another first person feels like it's wrong to even eat a piece of meat from from that cow. But he says this in verse three: 
Let him let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. The the person that that eats the the person that eats the nice sixteen ounce prime rib don't let him despise or look down on despise words despise there I mean look down on the, the, this person that that does not eat the same way you eat and let not him that don't eat it. it the the Paul says here judge him that eateth. You don't look at him and, and, and think bad of him because he is eating a piece of meat. Colon, for God has received him. He didn't say which one of them. God received both of them. The one that does eat the meat and the one that doesn't eat the meat, God received both of them. Who art thou to judge another man's servant? We won't get into what people try to go with this one right here, but we'll just deal with what's at face value right here. To his own master, he standeth or fallen. Who is the master of every believer or should be the master of every believer? The hymnologist said the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. The master is, is the Lord himself. Yea, he shall be up, holding up. The Lord is going to take care of him, is going to hold him up. Even when the apostle Paul saw himself to be in a, in a failure type situation, when he had prayed three times about his thorn in the flesh, the Bible said that the Lord told him in his weakness that, he was made strong in him and his grace was sufficient. So he says, for God is able to make him stand. God is able to hold you up. He's not going to let you fall because both of you are believers and he has you in his hand. And the, the John declared there through the person of Jesus Christ, the words of Jesus there in the 10th chapter of the gospel according to St. John, they're in my father's hand and no man can pluck them out. Verse five said, one man esteemed one day above another. So it's not just about what you eat either. But I tell you, it's not about it's not about what you eat or the days. It's not the main point that Paul was talking about here. He was dealing with every type of situation, and we'll get to that in just a second. But we try to try to try to keep it with the with the meat. But he was trying to tell us and teach us something as we were going as we were going through this. He said, one man esteem of uh, a day above another, colon. And this can get into some disparate. Uh, disputations. You, you can get to fighting about it, disputes about it, and, and just fight all the time and have, have little wars going on. Colon, another esteem of every day alike. I just worship every day. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. If he's fully persuaded in his own mind, he has taken into account all the argumentations about this, and this is what his conviction tells him. So don't try to put your convictions on someone else when it is a non-essential thing. The most important thing is that you're both saved, that you're both a part of the family of God. You've all been, been saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So that, that I can see these, these, these things happen because I, I, I've been to some people's cars and I'll hear the radio station because I don't really listen to the local radio station that, and, and people be complaining and trying to get you to be a part of their particular religious faith or whatever it is by telling you it's bad for you to be going to the church you're going to because you worship on the wrong day. And, and, and I hear that type of stuff and it's just kind of disturbing to me, but they don't care if this, they're disturbing me. And, but I would care that I would be disturbing them. I hope I would, if I just got into this disputation with them, just wanted to fight with them about that all the time. He that regarded the day regarded it not regarded it unto the Lord. If you if you picked a day and you're giving that day totally to God, you you are giving that day to the Lord. You are regarding the Lord. And he that regarded not the day, that particular day that that person has already picked, to the Lord he doeth not regard it. He that eateth eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. Whether he does or whether he doesn't, he's always giving God thanks. He, he's, done, he's not falling into your little rules, regulations, restrictions, and even traps sometimes. Stumbling blocks is what we'll get into in just a moment. For none of us liveth unto himself, and no man dieth unto himself. Now, this is not necessarily talking about actual living or dying in, in, in the sense that we might think it is. Living is a person that is living in liberty. He feels like he can eat the meat and there's, there's no problem with it. He's a person that's living. A person that doesn't want to eat the meat because he feels like it's wrong, he's dying. He, he's dying to himself. So whether he live it or die, he, he's, he's, he's God. Whether we live or die, we live unto the Lord. 
Whether we, uh, or whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord, colon. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Whether we, you, you feel like you have liberty or whether you feel like you're, you're, you're bound by certain aspects of the law, you're both the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be the Lord of both the, the dead and the living. Now, that can be talking about both of them right there. The, the, even, even the dead that, that die out of this body and into the, the leaving this earthen tabernacle. Now, before we start into the actual 10th verse, let's deal with the, what we call the big three in the church. When I was a, a young man coming up, when I was a boy coming up in the church, and when, when, when we used to sing Amazing Grace before the preacher got up to preach, and, and we sung the extended version, it took seemed like it took an hour and a half even for the introduction for the musicians to finish playing that, that. And then we started and only sung the first two stanzas of Amazing Grace. I thank God that we sang all of them now, and we don't it don't take us an hour and a half to sing them. But, but still, it was the big three. The big three things were smoking, drinking, and gambling. And, and, and people just was really down on a person. Yeah, they, they felt like a person couldn't be saved if they were smoking, if they smoked a cigarette, if they did that, and the preacher couldn't wait till his sermon was over so he could go outside and burn one and light one up. And and he didn't feel like he was gonna go into hell, but that was one of the things that had been put out and been taught to him as he was coming up. It was That was one of the things. The real big thing that people felt like in the church, it was going on all the time, but it wasn't one of the big threes. It wasn't in, in there. And drinking, and they said drinking. When, we, when you drink alcohol. The Bible tells us not to be drunkards, but it didn't say anything about you can't drink. I don't drink. Never have. Tried a, a beer one time that my cousin gave me when I was a child, and I couldn't figure out for the life of me why someone want to put something in their mouth that doesn't taste as good as Kool-Aid. And I, so I stopped drinking before I even got started. But if you want to drink, I'm not going to get down on you. I'm not going to try to hurt you with it. I'm not going to point my little gnarly finger at you because you probably can point a bunch of them back at me because I'm sure that there are things that you wouldn't approve of in my life. So I would, uh, a person that drinks... Just try not to get drunk. But if you do that, if, if you're doing it to yourself, that's you, you, you're, you're by yourself. Well, people say, well, that's drinking is wrong. Well, if, if drinking is wrong, then what was Jesus? What, what was Jesus? He said, he said there in the seventh chapter of the gospel according to St. Luke, he said, for John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. And ye said, he has a devil. Verse 34 of that seventh chapter of, of, of the gospel according to St. Luke says, but the son of man, Jesus was talking about himself, is come eating and drinking. And ye say, be, be, behold, a glutton man and a wine bibber, because he drunk him some wine, a friend of pub, publicans and sinners. He said, you, you feel like I'm just the worst thing in the world because I do drink. Felt like John was worse because he didn't drink. So, so you're looking down on people because they're drinking. If you want to get you a case of beer, I, I can remember when I was when I was young, they, they come out of the out of the store in the afternoon after a man get all work, he come out with a six pack. Now they come out with a whole case. And I'd be I'd be laughing at some of my friends when I when I see them doing that type of thing. But that's that, that's okay. That's that's them. They, that's that's what they want to do. Drinking and gambling. I, I feel like a person shouldn't gamble if they especially if they're doing it recreational, they got plenty. I I I, I, I've, I've reprogrammed myself on that one. I, I know they gambled for the vesture that Jesus had on, that, that he was wrapped in while they rolled him around and, and tried to mistreat him before they put him on the cross. They, they, they gambled for that garment that he was wearing. But the, but the Bible didn't say because a lot of things in the Bible were taking chances. Even the, the, the way that the priest decided things at one time were taking chances. So I couldn't tell a person that had plenty, that are, had enough, that would, made sure their bills were paid, that they couldn't go and gamble. They couldn't buy a lottery ticket. I, I wouldn't tell them that. I, I don't do it, but still, if they did, it, and but if I wanted to, I feel like I would have liberty to do such a thing. So uh, the gambling, yeah, I, those were the big three. We didn't, it, so... When, when we get to that right there, when we understand that right there, we understand that the apostle Paul here is not just talking about eating food and drinking wine and, and, and days that 
people that pick, which were big days to the, to the Jewish nation, some of them. And we pick a, the day of Sunday, some of us, but some of them might pick the, the actual Sabbath day, which was Saturday at that time in the history of the Israelite nation in the days of wilderness wonder. But we get to this first 10 and it says, but in light of all of those things that came before this, but why do thou judge thy brother? Since we just see that if you're doing this, you do it unto the Lord. Whether you don't do it or do it, you're doing it unto the Lord. Why are you judging your brother? The word there, judge, is krino in the Greek. Krino means to judge to condemnation, to condemn that person, to cast them out, to throw them away. We just determined that both of these brothers are saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. There's no way anyone can kick them out, cast them out, pluck them out of God's hand. There's no way that that can happen. So why are we just this mere man trying to condemn another man because of his way of thinking on non-essential things according to salvation. Why are we, we judging him to condemn him? Why are we trying to put him down? Yes, Jesus did say there, and, and I know some of our commentators told us don't deal with this, but he did say there in the seventh chapter of the gospel according to St. Matthew, first verse, judge not lest you be judged. For with the same measure you use to judge, that person will be measured back to you. In other words, you'll be judged with the same tape measure that they use, that you use to, to, to measure that person. So, so it says here, but Jesus didn't tell us not to identify because in that same seventh chapter of the gospel according to St. Matthew on down in there, he told them you that, that you will know those, that those, those priests and teachers and, and, and prophets that were wolves in sheep's clothing. He said, you'll know them by their fruit. In other words, you didn't have to judge them to condemn them, but you needed to judge them to identify them. So you would know not to listen to that mess. You, you need to, you, you judge by identification but you don't judge to condemn. And, and this was Crino. It was judging to condemn. Or oh, why do if thou said it not, thy brother, that going on into this 10th verse? Why, why do you say it not? Why do you look down on him? Why do you despise him? Why do you look at him like that and, and, and put him down just because he doesn't worship on the same day that you worship? Why, why, why are you looking down on him? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Every one of us, all there is the same in the Greek and the Hebrew. It means all. So we're going to stand there at now. The good thing about this, if both of you are saved, are you standing to be judged for your sin? If your sins have been forgiven, past, present, and future, you're not going to stand there at the judgment seat of Christ and the Lord start bringing up this tablet and say, wait a minute now, what, what, what about this day? He's not going to do that. That you're not there to be judged for sin because you, the, the sins that you and I have, because we have trusted Jesus Christ, they have been washed away. That's, yes, we're still doing them, but they have been washed away. The slate is clean. When we stand before the Lord one day, he's going to be judging us in a, in a award ceremony. It, what, did, what did you do with the things that, that, that I gave you? What did you do with the ministry that was laid upon your heart when you took off and went down the other way at Costco because you didn't want to meet up with that person and the spirit was telling you all they need is a simple word from the Lord, from you. And you have it. You just a lay person, but you know Jesus. You know enough to tell somebody about it. So, so to, to offer Christ to him. So the judgment seat, that's going to be the Bema seat. That's going to be where, where, the, where all the believers stand there. And none will be there for condemnation. We won't be condemned at the Bema seat, at the judgment seat of Christ. But we'll all stand there, every one of us. Verse 11 says, For it is written, As I live, said the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Ex omelageo is confessed at the, at the end of this verse. Ex omelageo means to fully agree. It means to acknowledge. Now, we, we, to dealing with that, this came from Isaiah the, the 45th uh, chapter, the 23rd verse is where the Apostle Paul grabbed this from, but he brought it up and put it in Greek terminology for us. And as I live, saith the Lord, every knee, every, just like all, every knee shall bow to me, every knee. This is talking to two believers at this particular time. Paul is talking to every believer is going to bow and every tongue confess to God, agree with God. Be fully agreement with God about this particular thing. It, it, we're going to all agree with God 
that his righteousness is true. His judgment is true at this award ceremony. You know if your, your halo is lean to the side because when you had an opportunity to do that, you didn't do it. When you had an opportunity to share with somebody, you wouldn't share. When you had plenty in your deep freezer and you let it ruin and, 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 and the ice start growing across it because you were too mean to hand the family next door whew, that needed something to eat, just a little bag of, of, of corn or something out of the freezer. I'm telling you about myself now because we, we country folks. But so so at one day, all Christians are going to stand to be judged before God, but not for sin. We're not going to stand there being judged for sin. But this award ceremony is going to be done to see what you did for the glory of God, for the glory of God and in obedience to God. So now we every tongue is going to confess. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Every one of us, doubt that word is every again. Every one of us that are believers are going to give an account of himself to God. Now, you, you, you're thinking again, back to sin. No, no, not account to, unto sin. Remember that the, the hymnologist said, only what you do for Christ will last. It'll, it'll only be what you do for Christ that'll be remembered in the end. So, so every man... Every one of us will give an account of, of himself to God. We judge others, not having knowledge, nor the authority to do so. We don't have the authority to, to judge another person. We focus so much attention on the person in front of us or the person behind us. We're, we're looking at them and, and thinking, that well, I'm just as good as that person or better. But we must give an account of only one person, and that is ourselves, is what, what Paul is saying here. What did you do with the material possessions that the Lord blessed you with? Did you share something with someone else? Or did you give someone that opportunity to minister to someone's heart and you saw how, how low they was and the Holy Spirit was pushing you that way? What did you do with it? How did you handle that situation? And the spiritual gifts that God gave you, everyone has at least one gift. So what did you do with that spiritual gift? Did you hide it under a bushel? Or did you let it shine so that someone will see the light of God in you and desire to glorify him also? How, what did you do with it? Did, what, did, did you make it where it was, it was a benefit to the kingdom of God? Did, what, what, you're going to give an account of it one day. You're going to have to give an account. Is it going to be considered wood, hay, and stubble? Paul talked about this, this particular thing there in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He said, for others foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon the found, this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, colon. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he has built thereupon, he shall receive an award, a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, colon, but he himself self shall be saved, yet as of by fire. The person that is a believer, he's going to be saved. He might get there and his and and he, everybody else is wrapped down with awards, and he 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 come out just just smoking because all his all the things he thought was awardable got burned off because they were wood, hay, and stubble. They didn't have any anything to them. You didn't do anything with your material possessions to help build up the body of Christ, to build the kingdom, to help in ministry opportunities. You didn't share your spiritual gift with, with any, anybody else. Let us therefore, verse 13 says, judge one another. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, colon. But judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. He said, judge this. No, no, let's not judge anymore in that type of way. But let's judge this. In other words, judge yourself. Judge this, rather, that you don't put a stumbling block, that I don't put a stumbling block, that I don't cause someone else to sin because of me using my liberty in front of them or an occasion to fall or putting a trap or a snare so that they will be tripped by this particular thing. He said uh, in, our, in our brother's way, he said, think about it. If we're legal and we make our friends feel con condemned because we're not legal enough for them, we stepped off the beaten path. 
and we weighed them down with, with, with our legalism. And, and that, that, that would be a bad thing to do. That would be putting a stumbling block out there in front of them. But even if we were uh, uh, people that lived in our liberty and we caused them to stumble or, or caused them to fall, occasion to fall in, in what we did, we, we need to kind of stay there in the, in, the, in the center of God's will. Just watching things and knowing that this particular thing I probably shouldn't do in front of that person or if I'm very legal, then I realize that that is a brother and sister in Christ and they're saved just as saved as I am and we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Paul was teaching something here. Maybe everybody didn't understand this because people may not have understood that once they accepted Jesus Christ, they were eternally secure. If a person don't feel like they're eternally secure, then yes, they feel like they probably could knock somebody out because they're not living up to my standards. They're, they're, they're living up to God's standards because if they're saved, God has already, God is looking through at them through the blood of his son and they're definitely living up to his standards as bad as you think they are. Because he's not looking up on this. He said, for my own sake, will I remember your sin no more, all of you that are believers. Verse 14 says, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, colon. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Now, he says, look here. I, I know. He said, I know this. And then he's been, he persuaded by the Lord. But to be persuaded by the Lord, he had to be convinced even in his own mind. That's why he said, I know. To be persuaded means that you have settled all the argumentations about this particular subject in your own mind. And you have brought this thing back in and has made a full circle back to the Lord. And you agree with the Lord that there is nothing unclean. If you want to go back to the food, there is nothing unclean in, in the meat itself. And in and of it, in and of itself, but to him that has the opinion or esteem it, it is his opinion in his mind, in his conscience that it is wrong and this is unclean. To him, it is unclean. We're, he's going to make this more plain here a little bit later, saying that this is a sin to him. If a person considers a thing to be unholy, it is unholy to him. If he feels like it's unholy. Now, this thing that is unclean, that means it is common. That means it is defiled. It means it is unholy. So these things, he says, that nothing that we eat is like that. And nothing that, now, when he started talking about the unclean here and we get into the other aspects, you go back to the other chapter, there were some things that he did consider that uh, Christians shouldn't be doing. But, but here he, he's definitely talking about things that are questionable. That the scripture doesn't clearly state out and say, don't go and, and, and don't smoke, don't drink, and don't gamble. Because you saw D Jesus drinking. We just saw that. He, he said, I, I came and you called me a wine bibber. So, so we, we see that. And he, he said, that, but this person being poor, fully persuaded, that, that person can do this and it's not bothering them. But to that other person, it's unholy to that person. Verse 15 says, but if thy brother be grieved without meat. Now, walkest thou not charitably? This is not a question. Now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. He said here, if, you're, if your brother is grieved, he's looking at you sitting there with your knife and, and, and eating your 16 ounce prime rib and, and the juice just flowing out of it as you cut it and, and, and you put that a juice sauce on it and it, everything and he, it's just making him miserable. He's, he, he's grieved. It's, he's sorrowful in seeing you eating that like that. It saddens his heart. It, he's in distress and misery while you're eating it. He said, are, are you showing love to that person? Are you showing your faith in love to that person right there? You, you should demonstrate love. You shouldn't ruin that person because to destroy that person means to ruin that person. To ruin something is to put it in ruins, to where it is totally demolished, it's destroyed. And, and we talked about this a while back when we were talking about when Nebuchadnezzar came into the, the Judah there in Jerusalem, when he destroyed the temple, when he put the, the, the city of Jerusalem in ruins, at the, where, where the tumbleweeds was rolling down the road and, and nothing there, with, with life itself was just gone. You put that person in a position where life is just gone out of them because of how you're doing that. Destroy him not with your meat. 
He, Paul says here, Christ died for that person also. He died for him too. Don't, don't do that. He'll, he'll explain how you can handle this as, as we get on through this. And then he says here, verse 16, let not then your good be evil spoken of. Whoa, wait a minute, an oxymoron. He said, let not your good, if it's good, then how can it be evil? Well, well, this is how it can be evil. It's how you're doing it. When you're trying to spread your liberty like a, like like peanut butter on a piece of light bread. We, when, when you're trying to spread it around and, and, and you don't care who it hurts. Your liberty, you consider to be good. Don't let your liberty cause others to blaspheme or slander the kingdom, the faith. In, in Jesus Christ, the other people that say, well, look at those people. They're calling themselves saved and look at, look at what they're doing. Don't, don't let it be evil spoken of is what, 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 what Paul is saying here. And then there's a colon at the end of verse 16, which means he's going to further explain this. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but here the kingdom of God is, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. He said it is righteousness. What is righteousness? Righteousness is it, having a right mindset or spirit with God. It, standing in a right position with God. The only way that you and I can stand in the right position with God is that we have trusted his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, as, and, and, and accepted his death, burial, and resurrection as, as a substitutionary payment for our sin debt in full. And, and when you have got to that point, you're standing in the right position before God. And, and God is pleased with you. But righteousness, you're righteous in, in, in this kingdom. And, and peace, peace, peace here. It, it, it means that you are living in a position of, of being having harmony with the other people, the other brothers and sisters in Christ also, whether they feel like you shouldn't eat this or that, or whether they feel like you should worship on this day or that. If we're all a part of the body of Christ, we, it doesn't matter about the days or what you eat. It, it, that, that's not the essential thing. The essential thing is righteousness, harmony, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, this joy is a different joy than the worldly joy that we think of. This joy here is like Sister, Sister Shirley Caesar talked about. The world didn't give it and the world can't take it, take it away. Because this joy is in the Holy Ghost. And why do you have the Holy Ghost? Because the Holy Ghost was put inside of you. The Holy Spirit was put inside of you. The moment that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, the Apostle Paul said. So you're sealed. And, and this joy that you have is not based on your outward circumstance, what's going on all around you. You have an inner joy in the person of the Holy Spirit that's living in you. So joy in the Holy Ghost. And these three get mentioned again here, not in, in for word for word, but they're talked about here in the next verse. He said, for he that in these things serve Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. He said, this, the people that, that, are, that are living in righteousness, peace, and the Holy Ghost are in the right standing with God, in harmony with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and have, fulfilling or uh, having this joy, which is a fruit of the Spirit in the Holy Ghost. Having this, this like this, this person is well pleasing to God. That's what acceptable is right there. This person, we just said that they're standing in a right standing with God. They're well pleasing to God. And also they're, they're dokimos. They're approved of men. Dokimos in the Greek, it means they, they have been tried. Men have watched them and saw that he really cares about it. He really is a righteous person. He really is a person that wants to live in harmony. He won't fight about it. He won't get into disputes about this particular thing or that. He has an inner joy that's just walking with him around. And men approve of it because they've tried him. They've seen him. They, they know what it's all about. That, that Greek word dokimos. That person... That is righteous. He's saved by 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 through by grace through faith. That they're 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 there. This brother and and this this joy. It's not this just this outward appearance of things. It's that inner thing that's going on in this person's life. Verse nineteen said, "Let us therefore follow after the thing which maketh for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another." This is a big verse. I think it's our main thought verse. He said, let us. It, 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 some, sometimes I used to, when I, when I read Dr. McGee's books, and, and he'll say, now we fix to have a lettuce salad. 
And so this is, this is some lettuce right here, something good for us to eat on, verse 19. He said, let us therefore follow after the thing which make it for harmony, bring in harmony. Let's follow after this that, that, that brings in unity with the brothers, what we're not fighting all the time, brings in harmony. And, and, and I told you that a while back, I come from a musical family and it's nothing like hearing the, the, the sounds of a, a three-part harmony coming together or even a four-part harmony coming together and everybody's singing their part and it's sounding just right. No one's trying to be above or beyond another. Everything is just in harmony. We're just living and that's the way it should be in the Christian faith. I'm not trying to be better than you, above you or anything like that. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all on the same battlefield for the Lord and we're going to get there. There are going to be some, some, some storms and there are going to be some clouds. There are going to be some rain. But at the end, we'll, we'll be able to get there together. Make for harmony and things wherewith one may edify another. Now that is big right there. He said this, this right here. Let us diligently go after, aim for and pursue things which bring harmony and ways to build up one another. Edify is to build up. It is to build up. When I think about edifying, I think about a building being built when it, uh, the bricklayer goes out there. And when he gets there, there's no bricks on the site. He has to order his bricks. He has to get the bricks to the site. He has to get sand for the, to mix the mortar. He has to get the mortar mixed. He has to, has to get a, a unit to, to stir the mortar and get it mixed up. He has to have a wheelbarrow to take it over to the site. He has to have his scaffolding set up. When you do all the things that it takes to build, you won't have time to tear down. You've got too much to do to build up. If we spend more time in, in promoting harmony and building up the body of Christ, building up people instead of tearing them down, you don't even have time to tear down. If you spend time tearing down, then you're wasting time that you could be building. So here he's telling us to edify, to build up one another. That kind of hit me a little bit right there. Verse 20 says, for meat destroyeth not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. He said, look here. He said, for meat destroyeth not the work of God. For, for the sake of God, it doesn't, don't undo and break down the things that God has already started in that person's life. That he's already working on in that person's life. Yes, they may change one day and decide they want to eat a piece of meat too. But let them learn that by sitting under and hearing the word of God, not you disputing with them on that. Let them hear the word of God and it will open them up. Faith come by hearing. They, they begin to understand. And one day, many things have changed in my life from when I was a child that, that, to where I am now. Just from hearing the word of God, understanding and studying the word of God, just pray that the Lord will bring them to that point too. If you feel like you're at a point where they can't live in their liberty and you're living in yours and they have a problem with yours. So let's edify and build up. Don't let, don't let food destroy us though. Don't let food ruin that, that Christian's life that uh, or ruin the fellowship to put it, put it to where there's nothing there. Even the sidewalks are dry when you, when you walk down through there. Yes, you, you yourself, you can eat all the meat you want to, all the foods you want to. But it's wrong if you meet, eat that meat, if you're eating that food with the intent of causing that other person to do something that's sin to him. If he feels like it's unpure, unclean, then it's unholy to him. So don't cause him to, uh, don't, don't offend and don't call, put a stumbling block even on yourself. Because it puts you in a place, in a bad place also. Verse 21 said, it is good neither to eat, it is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbling, or is offended, or is made weak. He said, it is, it is good neither to eat flesh, or eat meat, nor to drink wine. It would be better while in their presence not to eat the meat, nor to drink the wine, or do anything. Oh, wait a minute, do anything? We, we hadn't been hearing much of that. Paul is talking about even the things that you do in your liberty. 
You feel like you can go watch that movie and it won't bother you. And it probably won't. You, you are walking in your liberty and you walk right up in there and watch that movie. It doesn't bother you at all. But that person feel like it's wrong for you to do it or them to do it. So while they're looking at you, don't do it. Now, you can't do anything about a person following you to the theater to see if you're going to go watch. That, that's a different situation. But you don't have to try to put this in front of them to try to hurt them in the way that you express your liberty in Christ. You don't try to trip or stumble your brother. You don't entice that person to fall into sin. So you don't do anything that would cause them to stumble, fall into sin, or even weaken their faith. That, that word made weak is, is in, in the Greek is made feeble. A person that is feeble, they, they have no strength to fight. They can't fight against the things that are coming against them. Even as you walked in there and it didn't bother you, they might walk in there and it get them totally disturbed and they walk out there and fall into sin just because of that. That person is, is, is weaker than you. Don't cause them to do that is what Paul says. He said, has thou faith? If, if you have faith, you, you've got faith. Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. You'll be happy if you don't bring conviction upon yourself or some condemnation upon yourself because you caused that person to do what you feel like you were totally allowed to do and, and your conscience is clear when you do it. Don't, don't cause another person. Since your faith is strong in this area, exercise these things comfortably as in the presence of God with just you and God, God knowing that you're doing this and he's fine with you doing this. You, you're drinking your, your, your little drink, whatever it is, and, and God knows you're doing. He didn't tell you not to do it. And, and you feel like he's not telling you to do it. So you'll be happy. Happy is a person that doesn't convict himself because of what he chooses to do. Verse 23 says, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. Colon. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Wow, to sum it up, Paul says here, To this person that is not sure that it's right to eat or drink that particular thing, or do that particular thing, it, 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 it condemns him. It makes him feel like he's, he's cast out. It puts him in a place of being damned if, if he eats that, if he does that, if he indulges in that, if he goes there, if goes to those places. And, and, and it, because his faith is his moral conviction. This is, this is his, his assurance. And you just, his, his moral conviction and faith and, and, and assurance just got scattered by what he saw you doing. So you don't do it. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. This person's conscience is telling them that this is wrong. So to him, it is wrong. If he doesn't really believe with a strong conviction that God approves of this, it is sin to him. With strong convictions, if he doesn't believe that this is okay for him to do. If his conscience is telling him it's totally wrong, then he probably should leave it alone. If you're having to ask the question if this is wrong or that, maybe you ought to leave it alone from now until you understand what the word of God says about it. There are a lot of questionable things that we bring up before people all the time that are not clearly spelled out in the word of God. But a person will have to use their own convictions and the Bible is letting you know that Christ died for both of those people if they're believers and he's not gonna cast you out and he's not gonna hold things against you that he didn't spell out in the scripture for you and your own conviction, your own conscience can help you deal with that particular thing. Father God, we do thank you today for the study of your word. And Father, we do pray that this word will help us and sermon on our hearts and minds and help us to stop pointing our fingers at others when we feel like they're not living up to our standards. Father, we do pray that you will search our hearts, forgive us of sin. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining the Sunday School Lesson Review. Hope to see you next week. God bless you all.